morning. Um, today I'm going to be giving a talk about a study we conducted at VCU um, titled Improving Decreased Heater Cooler Efficiency as a Result of Heater Cooler Infection Control Strategy. I'm sure you all have um, already seen a lot of presentations on heater coolers, so you can add another one to the list. Um, I have no disclosures. The agenda today, I'm going to uh, discuss the function of a heater cooler unit, examine the relationship between bacteria and heater coolers, discuss how institutions are attempting to mitigate that infection risk, and reveal a study intended to address heater cooler inefficiency, and then the results of that study. So a heater cooler, most of you all are aware of this one. Um, this is the Levanova 3T. It controls temperature by heating or cooling a reservoir of water, and it's connected to um, a heat exchanger on the pump via water lines. Uh, typically consists of at least two circuits, a cardioplegia and a patient circuit. Um, Mycobacterium chimera, it's a bacteria we're probably all familiar with. Um, it's uh, non-tuberculosis mycobacterium, uh, belongs to the mycobacterium avium complex. It was first described in 2004, primarily uh, causes pulmonary disease in the elderly. It's found in environmental sources such as water, um, including municipal and hospital water sources, uh, and as well as soil. And it survives by forming a biofilm on the inside of tubing and pipes. So the current evidence leaking the, the heater cooler in this bacteria. Um, in 2015, Sachs and um, colleagues in Europe, they uh, came out with this uh, study. Uh, two patients with M. chimera, uh, led to a retrospective study at their institution. And what they found was that between 2007 and 2015, they actually had six M. chimera infections after cardiac surgery. The presentation after surgery was up to three and a half years, and they found identical strains in the heater cooler as well as the patients. And they confirmed the pathway to be aerosolization via the exhaust fan of the heater cooler. And then after this publication, there was um, kind of a whirlwind, and uh, multiple sites worldwide reported M. chimera infections. Again, this, was, this is out of Europe by Kohler and this group. Um, it was over a four-year period. They had 10 patients with uh, disseminated M. chimera, which was attributed to the heater cooler. The patients ranged from 1 to 61 years old. The median surgery to diagnosis time was 21 months. All patients had some type of prosthesis, such as valves and aortic grafts. So they started with antibiotic therapy, and uh, they had to do redo surgery as well for these patients. And uh, four out of 10 of these patients actually succumbed to their infection. And then in New York in 2017, Balsam in this group, uh, they, this was the first reported cases of uh, M. chimera after LVAD implantation. They had two patients. It was thought to be from heater cooler use. The median surgery to diagnosis time was 21 months. Both patients were treated with antibiotics as well as surgical debridement, and both are, uh, were alive at the time of publication. This is a couple years old. Another study by a group in the UK in 2016, this is one of the larger patient uh, populations. They had 18 patients tested positive for M. chimera over an eight-year period at 11 different hospitals. Um, they all had positive heater cooler aerosol samples. All the patients had undergone valve replacements prior to the infection. And the median time of surgery to presentation was 19 months. And then half of these patients died. So after all these um, articles were coming out, Holler and colleagues began an investigation into what caused this global outbreak. And what they found was that um, in the manufacturing plant in Germany, um, they found these uh, used as well as new heater coolers, they all tested positive for M. chimera. So they looked at the process and found that the heater coolers were being water tested and then not cleaned and then uh, sent out to various institutions in the world. So this suggests, at least uh, for some of the infections, that the point source, it was a point source infection. Um, it's interesting to note, the manufacturer changed 
um, their cleaning protocol on its own accord in September of 2014 after they themselves did some environmental testing and found um, the uh, infection risk. As a result, now, uh, Leva Nova, they've instituted a loaner program and they offer uh, deep cleaning and um, there's multiple uh, things we have to do as perfusionists to keep our heater coolers clean. So is this a current infection risk, uh, given that um, there is a point source infection? I think so. And I'm, I'm not the only one. White Kemper, in, back in 2002, um, this was the first report of uh, the heater cooler possibly being um, an infection risk uh, due to the water reservoir present in heater cooler units. And then uh, Kuhl and colleagues, they looked at the design of the Levanova 3T and found that it is unique and there's actually a design flaw that is um, only found on the 3T where it allows bacteria to aerosolize and release into the operating room. And then an FDA communication that was released last year, um, they are aware of some 3T devices manufactured after the September 24, 2014 um, protocol change at the, at the manufacturing plant. Um, they are aware of some of these that have tested positive for M Chimera. So to recap, Levanova, just formerly SORM, it's responsible for all reported cases of M Chimera um, infections after cardiac surgery. The transmission is via aerosol. The bacteria is very slow growing, so you see uh, patients presenting uh, years after their surgery. Which patients are at risk? Primarily uh, patients with open heart seizures, such as valves. I don't think there was any uh, cabbage infections. The treatment, there is no real gold standard at this point. Um, so we try antibiotics, surgical debridement, and then followed by prosthesis removal. It's associated with significant morbidity and mortality. At least some of these infections were due to contamination at the manufacturer, and it still likely remains uh, some type of infection risk. So the current FDA recommendations, even if your 3T device was manufactured after the cleaning protocol, is to direct and channel the heater cooler exhaust away from the patient, ideally to the operating room exhaust vent. <clears throat> so, that, like, that, like I said, the FDA said it, at a minimum it should be directed away from the operative field. Um, Sommerstein, he looked at how the, um, the heater cooler exhaust was affecting the ultra clean ventilation systems that we have in the OR and he found that it was ineffective at stopping aerosolized bacteria from the heater cooler from reaching the operative field and they suggested that we should um, separate the exhaust from the OR entirely. And then what Barker and his colleagues did, they, um, they remodeled the cardiac operating room entirely. They moved the heater cooler to um, an adjacent dirty utility room with its own ventilation and then ran water lines 15 feet through the wall to the heart-lung machine. At VCU Health, what we've done um, these have been kind of the bane of our existence. Um, we call this our heater cooler hut. Um, the 3T kind of sits in that enclosure there and it, you can see the chimney coming out of the top for the ventilation. We run the water lines 17 feet across the operating room floor to reach the heat exchanger of the oxygenator. This is another picture. This is the, again, the chimney. You can see where it leads into the wall there. And on the other side of that wall is a HEPA filter. And uh, this room is a substale room with uh, computers and, and some various supplies. So af after using this for probably a year or so, um, we had some com anecdotal complaints about the time it was taken to rewarm and cool and uh, prepare the warm shot for cardioplegia. So it gave me um, an idea for a research pro uh, question. And I have two of them. So does increased heater cooler tubing length decrease the thermal efficiency of the heater cooler? And can I insulate the long heater cooler tubing to increase the thermal efficiency of the heater cooler? So I have a couple hypotheses. 
uh, my first increased heater cooler tubing length does lead to a significant reduction in the thermal efficiency of the heater cooler and insulating the long heater cooler tubing does lead to a significant increase in the thermal efficiency of the heater cooler. My null hypothesis are that uh, these have no effect. The study design, um, these are the, uh, the materials I used. For insulation, I used uh, some supplies that were readily available at basically any hardware store. Um, used some rubber pipe insulation tape and then um, some rubber, just normal pipe insulation as well as some foam pipe insulation. So for um, cold, colder climates, you're probably more familiar with these than Floridians, but. Um, I had five study groups uh, the, I had a short tubing group with a heater cooler tubing length of seven feet. I had a long tubing heater cooler group with 17 feet uh, water lines. And then I had uh, the long tubing group with uh, foam, rubber, or rubber tape insulation, depending on which um, group I was studying at the time. And then I, I wanted to test for two things. I wanted to evaluate the difference between the heater cooler's ability to cool and then evaluate the difference between the heater cooler's ability to warm. <clears throat> so this is a picture of um, my uh, study design, and I'll kind of go through that briefly. So I have a test reservoir, a patient reservoir, a heater cooler with whichever um, uh, condition I was testing, and then a, a water reservoir, and I'll get to that here in just a second. Um, I had, my temp probe was located on the arterial line. Um, I used a Medtronic hard shell reservoir as well as uh, the Affinity oxygenator. It was primed with three, three liters of normal saline. Um, I used a McKay Rotaflow to pump it through the test oxygenator into the inlet of the patient oxygenator. And from there, it recirculated into the top of the patient reservoir and then gravity drained back into the test reservoir. At the same time I was doing this for the heat exchange part of um, the patient oxygenator, I was circulating uh, a 10 liter bucket of water and this was to, was to act essentially as a heat sink to keep the patient from warming or cooling too quickly. And at the same time, uh, the heater cooler with whichever condition I was testing was, uh, was turned on for the test oxygenator. So experiment one, the cooling test. <clears throat> uh, two cooling ranges tested for each tubing condition. I measured the time it takes the arterial line temperature to decrease seven degrees when the heater cooler is cooling from 38 to 28 and then from 28 to 18. And then timekeeping begins when the water bath temperature was decreased to the goal temperature. Each condition was tested three times. Warming, uh, the warming test, essentially the same. Um, two warming ranges tested for each tubing condition. I measured the time it takes the arterial line temperature to increase seven degrees when the heater cooler is warming from 18 to 28 and then 28 to 38. And then again, timekeeping begins when the water bath uh, was increased to the goal temperature. And e again, each condition was tested three times. So to establish a baseline arterial temperature, um, it was established by allowing the starting temperature to remain constant for five minutes. The analytical methods I used, uh, multiple comparisons were performed using one-way ANOVA and adjusted using Tukey's method, uh, and results were considered significant at a p-value of less than 0.05. So the results, something I didn't mission, mention, I also measured the flow through all these water lines and it remained constant uh, for each condition at 13 liters per minute. <clears throat> so for cooling group one, which was cooling from a water bath temperature of 38 to 28, the baseline arterial temperature that was established was 35.6. So I uh, cooled from 35.6 to 28.6. And the results here is just a, a graphical representation of the data, but so they're not statistically compared in this slide, but it's easy to see that the long uninsulated tubing took much longer to cool than any of the others. When you statistically compare these, um, every tubing condition, so short, 
uninsulated and then all the insulation, we're able to pull faster than long uninsulated tubing. Foam was able to cool faster than tape insulation, but was no different than rubber or short uninsulated tubing. And then rubber was able to cool faster than tape insulation, and short was able to cool faster than tape insulation also, as well as rubber. Uh, this is another way to view that, that last slide. Um, the takeaway from this is that the long uninsulated tubing was uh, cooled slower than any of the other uh, tes tested conditions. For the cooling, the second cooling group, which was 28 to 18, the baseline arterial temperature established was 26.7, so seven degrees drop from there is 19.7. The, uh, the spread was a lot tighter here, as you can see, for the time that it took. So the only significance found here was that the short uninsulated tubing was able to cool faster than any other condition. There was essentially no difference statistically between any of the insulations or any of the insulations versus uh, long uninsulated tubing. Uh, this Again, this is another way to look at the, the numbers. Um, short uninsulated tubing was able to cool faster than any of the other conditions. So it was interesting <clears throat> when you compared the cooling times between the, uh, the different temperature ranges. There were a couple uh, differences. So foam insulated long water lines were able to cool faster from a 38 to 28 degrees than they were from 28 to 18 degrees. And then the long uninsulated tu tubing was just the opposite. So they cooled faster from 28 to 18 than they did from uh, 38 to 28, which was uh, interesting. So for warming, warming from a water bath of 18 to 28, the baseline arterial temperature established was 19.7. So I warmed um, from 19.7 to 26.7. For the second uh, part, uh, warm from a water bath temperature of 28 to 38, which uh, gave us a baseline arterial temperature of 28.6. So I warmed from there to 35.6. So there was no difference between um, in the warming time between these groups found by ANOVA. So the results of the warming group um, encompass both groups together. Here's another graphical representation of the temperature adjusted warming times. When you statistically compare, there was no difference between any of the insulations whenever it came to warming. However, all the um, insulations were able to significantly reduce uh, the time it took for long uninsulated tubing to warm. And then again, short uninsulated tubing was superior to any other condition I tested. This is another way to view the data. Um, from this slide, it's important to take away that again that the long uninsulated tubing was inferior to any other tested condition and the short uninsulated tubing was superior to any of the other conditions. So can I reject the null hypothesis? Increased heater cooler tubing length does not lead to significant reduction in the thermal efficiency of the heater cooler. Well, I showed that it does, um, that long is inferior to short tubing from 38 to 28, from 28 to 18, and then from uh, while it was warming. So I can reject, reject that null hypothesis. My second null hypothesis, insulating the long heater cooler tubing uh, does not lead to a significant increase in the thermal efficiency of the heater cooler. Well, long was slower to cool than the insulation uh, types from 38 to 28. However, there was no difference 
in long and in uninsulated tubing and, and any of the insulation types from uh, 28 to 18. But again, the insulations were more effective at, um, at warming than, than long uninsulated tubing. So I would say that I, I can reject that null hypothesis also. So what do we do with that? Um, it's just the takeaways from this are that the current heater cooler design, it likely still remains an infection risk that, that we need to be aware of. And if you decide to move the heater cooler away from the pump, it does lead to a decrease in the efficiency. And um, you can insulate the water lines to increase the efficiency compared to uh, the uninsulated lines, but it's still not as efficient as the short water lines uh, close to the pump. The limitations, obviously this was in vitro, so this would need to be taken into the OR before you could really say one way or another. Future studies, they should examine ergonomic uh, implications of having the water lines draped all the way across the floor. Um, it provides a tripping hazard uh, depending on uh, the layout of your OR. We actually had a perfusionist who uh, tripped over these lines and broke her kneecap. Um, so it's something to think about. Um, the condensation, it's, it, it was interesting. Um, for, the, for those who are familiar, anytime uh, you cool, um, their condensation can present itself on the water lines. And the insulation appeared to blunt that effect, or at least I couldn't see any condensation when insulation was used. And um, if you place the heater cooler outside the operating room, it could provide a conduit for bacteria to enter the operating room. Um, so that's also something to keep in mind. The acknowledgments, I would like to thank uh, David Holt. He helped me uh, with this study. And then uh, Kaylee Sampson, who was my statistical statistician for the study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam, for your research. And I've, in my travels, too, I've seen various uh, opportunities for uh, growth on this heater coolers too on the way they place their heater coolers some of them